Court. Hey everybody, I'm Chris Metzler, one of the programmers here with SF DocFest. Um, we're uh, glad to be back and now both live in person and also virtual. Um, we're really excited to be able to kind of share this really wonderful film, which actually happens to be made by a Bay Area, Bay Area filmmaking team and a Bay Area subject that um, you've probably read about in the newspapers, but now you've already seen the film and you're here for the Q&A, um, our opening night film, Ricochet, and we're here with uh, co-director Chihiro Rimbush. Uh, nice to meet you, Chihiro. Wonderful to be here, Chris. So excited to be part of San Francisco Doc Fest and to finally bring this film home for everybody. Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, I think for those of us in the filmmaking community, um, we're kind of aware of uh, both uh, your and uh, your co-director Jeff Adachi's um, uh, legacy and kind of uh, work in the film community, but maybe you can kind of give us a little bit of a background of um, your co-director Jeff and what kind of inspired him to kind of uh, make this film and what were some of the kind of challenges that uh, unexpected challenges in telling the story that you didn't expect from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. So Jeff obviously is most well known for his day gig as the San Francisco public defender for uh, about 16 years. Uh, he had just gotten an election to his um, fifth consecutive term when he passed away in 2019. Um, and so his side job is making documentary films. And I was lucky enough that he approached me to be his editor on a series of them actually beginning with a ride um, and then Defender. And this was the third in a series of films that he wanted to do. He really wanted to examine the criminal justice system as seen through the particular vantage point of public defenders, which he felt was like really underrepresented in media compared to the other side. So he had a vested interest obviously in telling that story. Um, but he was really passionate about it. You know, he'd been a filmmaker for almost as long as he'd been elected as public defender. So we'd been working together for a while when Ricochet came along and, um, and it was clear really early from just all the national news media and the coverage. And then obviously Donald Trump taking it and elevating that to be a storyline in his campaign and everything that unfolded. It was pretty clear that this trial was something really important to cover. And so right from the get-go, he got the cameras in. And as you can see from opening statements day, there we are with Matt and uh, later in the day, Francisco and Jeff himself. And, um, and it was kind of a leap of faith because nobody obviously knew which way the trial was gonna go and what was gonna happen and um, didn't even realize how much more of a life it would have um, even after the trial was over, even kind of how the, the results of the trial uh, is still pending ultimately. And so all the themes of it have been remarkably resonant. And obviously the biggest challenge for the film was Jeff's passing in 2019. He was the director, he was the producer, it was his vision. Um, and I was just the editor. I mean, just the editor. I don't want to, editors are really important, but, but Absolutely. I was not the director and producer. Um, and so when he passed, um, we all had a period of about six months of grieving. You know, to be honest, like, especially obviously Mutsko and his family, obviously all the public defenders he worked with every day. And um, while well, Jeff and my relationship was, you know, strictly professional, we'd worked on three films together. Um, you know, we'd had a few long edit sessions together, a few creative arguments and creative discussions, um, and a ton of like late night texts, emails, and his infamous five minute phone calls where he's on the way into a courthouse and <laughs> has an idea for the film. So without that, it was kind of trying to find our creative bearing. Um, and then all the little details when you take over a film from someone who passed away that, I don't know, that's not a typical thing we step into, but it, it can be as big as, you know, just trying to, um, you know, really unpack like the vision of Jeff wanted uh, in the film more deeply. And it can be as little as like, where are the release forms located? <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of sleuthing that happened with this. And Mutsko, his widow is a big part of being able to humor me at a time of grief to go and look in a storage facility for boxes for budgets or release forms or try to figure out the password for his laptop so he could find files that only Jeff knew about. Um, and so it, I think it took longer than it would have if he'd obviously been around. We had an extra year of just kind of getting caught up and then another two years to edit it. But I think the way it did serve the film is it gave us 
more history to look back on in another election cycle. And so when I was editing in 2020, there was a new presidential election alive and it kept all those themes really present for me that were back in 2016, 17. They suddenly were like very alive again, even after the election with the big lie and everything. Um, so in some ways, it actually helped the film for me to be still editing it all these years later. <laughs> Well, you did a nice job of uh, helping kind of bring Jeff's vision to life because I think it um, instead it's not just kind of a current event story. It, it really is kind of a uh, and say kind of a moral fable. I think that kind of deals with so many of these kind of um, contemporary issues that um, are being dealt with. Um, what are some of the challenges I think in telling um, you know? A doc, using kind of documentary to kind of tell a legal story. I mean, obviously there's the uncertainty of the ending, but like um, was Jeff's involvement something that kind of helped open the doors to kind of captured in certain ways or were there certain challenges um, uh, because of that? Because obviously, you know, courtrooms and um, legal cases, there's lots of confidentiality and things. And so how did you guys um, navigate that in making the film? That's a really good question. And the answer is in both helped and hurt depending on which scenario we're talking about so obviously him being the boss of the public defender's office really helped for access in the public defender's office <laughs> though that said matt and francisco are really resistant to the filming at the beginning so early on did they want any part like whether preparing for the biggest trial of their lives did they want any part of cameras like hovering over their shoulders in the room no they did not and and so it took a little bit of like jeff uh nudging or arm twisting a little bit, but um, also them just all understanding how important that this case and this trial could be and um, getting a little bit more comfortable when you have the cameras around enough, as you probably know, Chris, it's like after a little while, you just become the fly on the wall and eventually they sort of relented. Um, and so, you know, Jeff was obviously instrumental to that access. I think, um, you know, where it was more challenging was trying to get the other side. So he did reach out to the DA's office, Gascon, mm -hmm. to get that perspective, as well as to the Steinle family, um, I believe through intermediaries. And, you know, understandably, if that they're seeing that there's a film that's coming out from the public defender's office, there might be a little bit of resistance to like, well, how's the story going to be told? Um, so in that sense, maybe it was more challenging to, it wasn't coming from someone they viewed as just sort of an impartial third party that was completely coming from the outside. It was coming from the public defender. Right. Um, and then obviously just a courtroom access part, which was just what the judge decided. I think the judge realized um, how big the case was getting and maybe you know, all these judges are scarred from the OJ trial and, mm -hmm. you know, not, not wanting to uh, make themselves look bad. And so not only didn't he, did he not allow any um, video or photo images, but not even any audio. Mm. And so as a storytelling challenge, you know, especially as an editor, it made it really difficult. How do you tell a courtroom drama without the courtroom? And that's where it was really vital to get you know, a perspective of a juror or Dave Eggers who just happened to come in and write and observe about the trial, which is sort of like a, a storytelling gift because mm -hmm. he he can frame everything so beautifully as a writer. Um, and, you know, obviously Jeff's name kind of gets you connections, whether it's to, you know, people or donors or just navigating certain um, locations. Um, you know, Jeff has a, has a, had a certain force <laughs> where he could, he could sort of will things to happen, um, which I don't think I had the benefit of after his passing. Do you think, I guess, just in looking at, I know you'd mentioned some of the reasons why he wanted to tell this story. Um, do you think that if, um, if we'd been lucky enough to have Jeff around uh, more years, do you think he would have continued to kind of tell stories from that public defender's viewpoint or were there, um, was there something about, did he see documentaries more, like as kind of either kind of social for kind of kind of social driven reasons or was there kind of also just a larger kind of art that um, he really appreciated with filmmaking? I think it was both. I mean, I, he definitely, everything he did came from for, first and foremost from the social justice perspective, um, equity, those were really big things for him. I mean, so going back to his earlier films, racial, facial, 
um, even the slanted screen, which was sort of unpacking Asian American male portrayals in Hollywood, he kind of just had this thing for the underdog or for flipping certain narratives. And I think that was a real through line through all his work. I do know that when he passed, he was actually really pursuing um, in Hollywood. He was trying to do all these meetings with different producers and production companies, trying to get funding for this kind of vision he had of a series of the public defender's office off the ground. So I know he was doing a ton of work to try to push that forward. Mm. And um, I guess we'll never know exactly what that could have looked like, but we were left with the three films that, you know, maybe someday we'll be able to kind of, uh, you know, recut them together into a little triptych <laughs> trilogy. And uh, it could be like a three part uh, mini series or something. Um, well, yeah, I, th I, mean, I think they capture an interesting moment in time. Um, you know, it's not like these issues haven't been important before, but, you know, with each passing year, um, I think they have greater resonance. And hopefully as, you know, younger folks get a chance to see these films, hopefully they're inspired to, you know, continue on, um, uh, you know, you know, inspired to kind of create films similar to what Jeff did. And um, I mean, I would, um, obviously folks in the audience are probably wondering, it's like, you know, can you give us kind of a little status update of, you know, I know that um, the film was finished here this last year. And um, can you kind of provide an update to the case and also the folks that are seen in the film? Yeah, so actually there's a real, there's a new wrinkle to the, the case. It's just about to happen. Unfortunately, it'll be one week after we premiere at SF Doc Fest, so there won't be any change of titles and titles before then. But um, a moment, a day we've all been kind of anxiously wondering and waiting about is uh, June 8th, um, Garcia Zarate, um, the defendant in the film, is scheduled to have his sentencing. And so what happened was, you know, he and, and Tony Serra, who's the lawyer who took over the federal case, they'd been, you know, going through this for the last, you know, five years since his state trial ended in the film. Mm -hmm. And he's been in this Kafkaesque purgatory. And, um, and so, you know, he was judged mentally incompetent to stand trial, but because it's a federal case, they could keep him in, you know, almost indefinitely, or at least through the length of the maximum sentence, which is 10 years. Wow. Um, and so I think there was a sense of maybe just this was like the easier way out uh, to plead guilty and then get sentencing given he's already done seven years of time that the likelihood of him getting uh, a sentence that long was pretty minimal and that way he could finally be released it, not mm -hmm. so much an admission that he finally wanted to say he was guilty but just right. the way the system is stacked um, which says a lot about our system as well. Maybe that's another documentary film. Mm -hmm. So June 8th, he will have that sentencing happen and he will know his fate. Um, if it's seven years or less, I believe then he'll be released and ultimately deported um, to back to Mexico and then, you know, and see where his story goes from there. So, you know, it's sort of a mixed feeling. We all have been rooting for his release. It's not quite the way that um, one would hope um, mm. the wheels of justice would ultimately spin for him. But, um, you know, after all the time he's done in prison, it, like we're all, I think, just be glad to see him at least have the opportunity to, to get home. Um, yeah, that's for, it won't be served exactly, but at least it'll be better than what it is now. Better than what it is now. Sometimes that's the best that you can go for. Um, and then, yeah, Madam Francisco continue to do the, the great work that they're doing, the public defender's office. Matt's still the number two chief attorney as he was under um, Jeff, now it's Mano Raju, the new public defender. And, um, and Francisco continues to like kind of grow out the immigration defense unit there. Mm. Um, and it's actually serving as a model for a lot of other um, public defender units in the country. So just a couple of weeks ago, we did a screening in Tucson with a group of public defenders and activists who are trying to get a ballot initiative to get funding for public defenders to try immigration cases down there wow. right by the border. So it's exciting to see um, so that we had a screening and um, and that the local public defender spoke to their initiative. So, um, you know, I think we're all hopeful that maybe we can just spark a little bit more debate around immigration and also change the kind of tarnished image of public defenders that Hollywood's kind of <laughs> made them all seem like deadbeats who take the deal. And, and Jeff's office was anything but, you know, they were well-funded and um, you know, under Jeff's leadership, they were always fierce about um, really trying to pursue justice for their clients. 
Well, um, I think that's, um, I think some good things to think about. And, you know, um, obvious as a film festival and use of filmmaker, you know, where um, hopefully we know that the kind of power of films to kind of as a catalyst for change, um, you know, for the kind of legal team, what do you think, um, you know, what would Jeff want as we kind of leave the theater or finish watching the film at home? What do you think Jeff's takeaway would um, he want for the audience? And what would he want us to do to kind of help make changes in our own world? Well, I think like a big part of it is really, I think for so many people that I've talked to in the journey of this film and the other films is, and even before I started working on this film, is like we don't really understand just how um, broken our systems of um, criminal justice and immigration for that matter are. And, and I suppose you could even expand it to our pol politics and media, but that's a whole, that's a whole maybe bigger than, than one uh, small takeaway. Um, and, and I know it's something that he was passionate about when we had have discussions around this film, um, all three films we worked on really was just um, getting people to um, first understand the way the system isn't working and then um, get active in doing things about it around bail reform, for example, is a big one and, and mm. how that is something that's really stacked according to class and how people get justice. Um, just how, you know, if you just look at one big thing that the public defender's office did right before Jeff left is um, get people who are public defenders into the justice system. So you have uh, the new DA, Chase Abonian, came from Jeff's office. Uh, there's a, a couple of judges that came from his office at that same time wow. that are now working as judges. And so often those sides are more represented by prosecutors and people who come from that side of law enforcement, you know, and, right. and so... Um, just look at our new Supreme Court justice, former public defender, you know, the, and so there's all these like turns. And so it's like understanding like the only way to reform the system is from the inside out. And so what can we do to get people like that elected and to look at things that stack the legal system like bail reform? Um, and so obviously, I mean, there's a massive conversation to be had of it. I'm just scratching the surface. Matt and Francisco can certainly talk much more precisely and eloquently, but I know those are, um, those are like big immediate things we can do, like understanding who's in the justice system and how the voices that are inside the system as well as outside can really make a difference to outcomes for people that either destroy their lives or give them a second chance. Word. Um, well, thanks again, Chihiro, and, you know, thanks again for making a beautiful film and, um, you know, sharing Jeff's vision on screen with us. Uh, have a, a great day, and we're excited to have you as our opening night film at SF Doc Fest. Thank you. Looking forward to it.